So just hands up, who would like to make a difference and have maybe a, a happier life? Okay. A healthier life? A longer life? Okay. A more prosperous financially or a safer life? Okay, you're in the right place. Because what I'd like to share with you in the next 15 minutes or so is some of my research findings about making a difference. All sorts of differences, big differences, little differences, work-related differences, non-work-related differences. And then I'm going to put them into a framework for you so that you've got something to take away that you can apply to your thinking to achieve whatever it is that you want in life, or at least to accelerate your progress. Does that sound okay? Good. It, by the way, it will be a little bit interactive. There will be times when I do ask you questions. Sometimes, you know, I want them out loud and sometimes just have them in your head. So, let's just rewind time a little bit. It's 1997. I'm 34 years old. I've set up my first business. And I'm sitting, talking with my coach, Tim. And Tim's really wanting to help me move forward. And I'm saying to Tim, Tim, I need a vision statement. I need a mission statement. And he looks at me and he said, Andy, I don't think you do. I think you need a passion statement. So I thought, that sounds good. I'm a pretty passionate guy. So uh, I said to Tim, I said, right, what do I do? H how do I write a passion statement then? And he says, I don't know. I've just made it up. <laughs> so I thought, well, that's OK. I'll, 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 I'll have a business, and I'll be the first business that has the world's first passion statement. So I spent the next five, ten minutes or so writing down everything that I was passionate about. And right at the end of about 90 words were three words. And those words were making a difference. And that's really the, the start of my journey, where I really knew what I wanted to do. And that was to help make a difference and help other people understand what that difference was. So, Let's rewind a little bit further back. I'm 23 years old. I've been working for five years in a bank. Four happy years and one unhappy year. I discovered I didn't like lending money. Bit of a problem if you worked in a retail bank. I thought I'd go into a bank because I wanted to climb the career ladder. And that's fine. It's just that I found that my ladder was leaning against the wrong wall. So I got off that ladder, and at the age of 23, I went to work in the public sector. And I took a big pay drop, 25%, which is a lot of money when you're 23. And the second week that I was in my job as a team leader, they sent me on a training course. And it was that training course that really kind of like changed my life, because after a couple of days learning how to be a team leader, I discovered the power of questions. And I discovered that I was learning so much through being asked some great questions. And then I was practicing asking questions to help people. I thought, that's what I want to do when I grow up. I want to be a trainer. I want to help adults learn. And that was my goal. So I had my goal, and I had my reason why. Now, if, if I just go back a, 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 a little bit, I went to do some research about making a difference. And after I'd got my passion statement there, I said to Tim, I'm going to research this. And I put together a research team of eight people. One was full-time, seven were part-time. And we went out and did something called a phenomenological study. Now, that's the largest word I'm going to use with you, right? But a phenomenological study is when you study the phenomena of something. And what I wanted to study was the phenomena of people who made a difference. Now, we've all made differences. So the, I went to see my, my master's degree tutor, uh, and I said to him, how do I do this? And he described this method of phenomenological study, where basically I went out and I found three people that had made a difference. And I introduced these three people to our main researcher, who interviewed them. And he discovered what they were doing. And what we really wanted to find out was what people naturally did. The key success principles that people naturally apply when they're successful in achieving something, making a difference. And the first two of those were a reason why and a clearly defined goal. Most people didn't use the word goal, by the way, in the research. They used the word thing. But that thing was very clear to them. 
objective, target, goal, it's the same thing. I knew that my reason why, at the age of 23, I'd found it, was to be a trainer and help people learn. So, have you found your reason why? What is your reason? How old will you be when you really find the reason to do something that you really want to make a difference about? Because having found that passion, that desire, this is about motivation, it's about energy. What is it that you want to achieve? That's the clarity of your goal. How clear is your goal? Do you know, oh, by the way, do you know the occupation that is best in the world at goal defining? Anybody want to have a guess? Teaching? Teaching? Nope. Anybody else? I'll tell you. No. Nope. Taxi drivers. Taxi drivers are brilliant. What's the first question they ask you? Where do you want to go? If you go, not Scotland, mate, they're going to look at you a bit gone out, aren't they? So where do you want to go? I want to go into town, into the city. Which city? This city. Whereabouts? Drop me off specifically, because they need to know a destination. So my big tip to you is be your own taxi driver. Lock on to the destination with absolute clarity about where you want to get to. Back it up with a strong reason why. So I defined my goals. I wanted to be a trainer. And then I, I wanted to do a, a master's degree uh, and various other things. And when I did my master's degree, my dissertation was about career management. And I'd been helping a lot of other people with their careers. In fact, my first job as a trainer was in this very city, helping long-term unemployed people with disabilities get back into work. And then I got into management and leadership training. But knowing what you want to do is different from actually believing that you can do it. So the third key principle about making a difference is about having the self-belief. This is the voices in your head, by the way. Just in case you don't know how to measure your self-belief, you listen to the voices in your head. Now, I once heard it said that on average, we talk to ourselves about every 11 seconds. And if you're going, oh, I don't think I do, Andy. <laughs> you just have been. But the key is, are you talking to yourself in a really helpful voice, full of belief and confidence? Or are you talking to yourself in a hindering voice? Are you beating yourself up? Or are you bigging yourself up? So self-belief. Now, let's put those three things together. Okay? And here we have a triangle. This is what I call the internal triangle. We have the clarity about what we want. We have the desire, the reason why for wanting it. And we have the self-belief. Now, we interrupt this little talk for a popular music trivia question. I'm going to invite you to rewind over 20 years ago to 1996, the summer of 1996. This was the year that the Spice Girls burst onto the scene. Girl Power was here. What was the name of their first big hit single? Wannabe. And how did the catchy bit go? All at once you can sing. I'll tell you what I want, what I really, really want. Now, this was two years before I did my research. Right, in 98. But the Spice Girls had beaten me to the first two key principles. I'll tell you what I want is a clearly defined goal. What I really, really want is a strong reason why. Fortunately, they then went zigger zig uh. Okay? <laughs> Which is very good for me because uh, if they'd have gone, I'll tell you what I want, what I really, really want, and then I'll check my self belief that it's achievable. Right, you know, the rest would have been history for me. But they only got the first two key principles. So just remember a little bit of girl power. Focus on what you want, what you really, really want. Then check your self-belief that it's achievable. So let's look at the next two key principles. Principle four and principle five. This is about possibility thinking and prioritizing those and also involving others. So from our research, we identified that there were 10 key areas to think about possibilities that will get you to stretch wider and deeper than you would normally think. So just a little exercise for you here. Let's just do the first bit in your heads now. Think of a goal, something that you want to achieve. Make it really clear. Get an absolute calendar date about it. But just check that you're bothered. You really, really want it. And on a scale of 1 to 10, where 1 is low and 10 is high, just check your self-belief. 
Just imagine that my watch hand here represents belief and this hand represents doubt. This is like a seesaw. It's equally poised at 5 out of 10 and 5 out of 10. In an ideal world, we'd want the self-belief to be a 5 or at least a 6. So if we had what's called a self-belief wobble, we can adjust. You don't need a 10 out of 10 in self-belief. So having that in mind, I'm going to share with you 10 areas. Just turn these into questions and think for yourself, which of these, for the difference that you want to make, the journey that you're on, would warrant doing a bit more time and effort thinking through those ideas. The first of these is tasks. What possible tasks or things could help you to reach your goal? Next, resources. What possible resources? Resources can mean many things. Materials, equipment, what possible stuff could help you get there? The next four are about involving others. Before we think about who to involve, it can be really helpful to think, what are the reasons to involve others? In other words, how could others possibly help me in some way towards achieving my goal? Because having thought of those reasons, when you ask yourself the next question, who could that possibly be? More ideas will come into your mind. Now, most people think quite small and they think quite close to home. And I can guarantee you that if we did surveys here today, the three most popular criteria for involving others of categories of people would be friends, family and colleagues. Who we live with, who we work with, who we socialise with. Sometimes people even say, I've thought of absolutely everybody. No, you haven't. You've just thought of friends, family and colleagues. Because involving others means anybody in the whole wide world. You know, we could go on a search engine, a couple of billion people. It also involves thinking really wide. People that have ever lived, we have at our disposal the wisdom of the ages. Lessons that have been learnt that we don't have to learn, that we could use. So who could we possibly involve? The next two are about that link between the defined goal and the involving others. I call this the buy-in line. This is about two-way communication. So how could you possibly communicate what you want with others that could help you? And how could you possibly influence them and gain their buy-in? Now we need to come to a question that is still solution-focused but might not seem it at first. And that is, what are the possible obstacles? The barriers, the hurdles, the blockers, the things that might get in the way of me achieving my goal. The next one is about possible risks and implications that might be useful to consider on our journey towards achieving that goal. Having thought of those, the ninth in this list of ten is what are the possible ways to minimise those risks and ways to overcome those obstacles. So we're still thinking possibilities, quantities, ideas. We're not making any decisions yet. And then the tenth that we found from our research, a really useful question is, what are the possible assumptions? The things that I'm taking for granted that might be worth checking out. Those are the ten possibility thinking areas. So just make a note mentally to yourself or even as you write, which of those could I do some more thinking about to help me achieve my goal? Having done that, you can then prioritise them and build a plan of your most important ones in relation to your goal. So that's the first five things. The sixth key principle of making a difference is to actually take personal responsibility. And this is about choices. It's about saying, it's down to me. It's not, it's not my mum's goal. It's my goal. And I'm going to be accountable for it. And this links with the rest of the key principles. Right? Sometimes things don't always go according to plan. I don't always achieve my goals. But it's about taking personal responsibility and saying, I've got some choices. So I've got a choice about whether to be bothered or not. I've got a choice about clarity and redefining my goal. I've got a choice about how much time I set aside to do that possibility thinking. Choice about what my priorities are. We've got a choice about who to involve out of all those billions of people. And also, as we think about ourselves and our self-belief and answer the question, do we believe we've got what it takes? Have I got enough knowledge, enough skills, enough experience? If the answer to those is no, you have a choice about taking personal responsibility for your own development. 
But it's not just about six things. Those six things are about thinking. They're about thinking things through. The seventh key principle in making a difference is taking action and measuring the results. Thinking leads to action. The quality of your thinking will determine your actions. Those actions will determine your results. And what you've got here is a framework, a framework for making a difference. You can use it as a development framework to develop yourself, to think through and ask questions. You can use it to develop your team, friends, family, colleagues. I call it coaching. Just one person asking really great questions to help another person with their thinking. So it's a coaching framework. It's a thinking framework. But it's also a diagnostic framework. Because if you're not achieving the things that you want to achieve on your journey, you can look at that framework and say, right, which area should I spend a little bit more time on? Is it about the involving others? Should I redefine my goal? Should I even park my goal? Okay. So I give you this as a thinking framework to take away to help you on whatever journey is important for you. I've shared with you today my passion. I've shared with you a framework for thinking. My, my life now is about kind of helping others make a difference, taking this framework to millions of people around the world. So I hope it makes a difference in your life. Key thing to remember is, what's your passion? And if you had to write a passion statement, what would it say? And what is the difference that you want to make in your life? As my mother always taught me to say, and she is here in the audience, thank you for having me. And as my father always taught me to say, go forth and make a difference. Thank you very much.